Hi, it's me again, your host Christopher Snowden. You're watching The Swift Half with Snowden, a half hour television program in which I have a chat with somebody I rather like. And this time around, it is the man who makes all the best films, Martin Durkin. Hello. How's, how's it going? Very well, thank you. Lovely to be here. Ah, thanks for, yeah, we're here in the IEA, by the way, folks. We're here, we've nicked the Livewood Littlewood set, so we're particularly comfortable and in person. No Zooming this time. Now, Martin, I want to ask you about your films, <laughs> of which there are many, and I love them all. I love the one about Margaret Thatcher, which I've got here. That's what I like to hear. Death of the Revolutionary. I love the one about the Britain's trillion pound horror story. Oh, yeah. Now, when was that, mate? That was about 10 years ago? Yeah, that was uh, a, a, a few years back now. And a trillion pound referred to the amount of government debt, if you included lots of pensions and liabilities and stuff. It wasn't even the amount of actual kind of published debt, was it? Yeah, the trillion pound was the, was the kind of headline uh, uh, official debt. Because it sounded like a lot, didn't it, at the time? It's, well, it's, <laughs> to, to, <laughs> you saw hell's bells. And then you looked at the real debt and you thought, oh, my God, that's even worse. Um, uh, but now, I mean, you know, we've entered the stratosphere. 2.3 trillion now, plus. That's the official yeah, one. Yeah, that's and official. Then, right. You know, add on all sorts of stuff to that. Does that make you feel quite depressed? Um, yes, I mean, it makes me feel absolutely sh shocked and horrified that we're not more perturbed by it and disturbed by it. Um, and that, in turn, makes me worried that there is kind of a, 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 a political culture ideological, I mean, political is too narrow, um, a culture in Britain and the West which just takes these enormous uh, wrongs for granted. Mm. And, you know, sort of just to, to, to not notice something that huge and that immoral and that dangerous, I think is terribly worrying. And every party seems guilty of it to me. Like, it's, I think it's essentially an indictment of democracy that we'd probably do the same thing if we were in Rishi's shoes or Boris's shoes or Ed Ball's shoes or whatever. If we go, well, I've got to win the next election. It's only two or three years away. If I start putting up people's taxes a lot and cutting public spending, they're not going to vote for me. So I'll just keep on borrowing. And if I lose, then I'll just leave the next lot with the problem. And that's what's happened for a long, long time. Now, to be fair, the Tories made some effort under Osborne to kind of bring in some kind of uh, semblance of responsibility and prudence doing not that successfully but they had a go at it and Ed Bowles at the time said you know if there's another Labour government 2010 we're gonna have to make make cuts but that has gone out the window across the board now isn't it because Corbyn I mean Corbyn said his, his manifesto was was costed but it, it wasn't I don't think anybody thought it was there isn't any incentive is it in a democracy such as ours to actually balance the books anymore yeah no I think that you're, you're, you're right I mean it's incredibly um uh, depressing that democracy doesn't work mm. and, in the sense that you know there is obviously a status establishment and it goes beyond parliament it's the civil service it's the it extends to that huge swathe of people i know you hate me talking about class uh, but no, that I kind of, love you talking about the new class the new class about, the, yeah. the, the, you know the public sector the the third sector you know vast numbers of people who are tax consumers directly or indirectly and regulators or involved in that uh, in, in, in some part of that regulatory planning regime um, and they have uh, they are in, in in power you know they're in power in the universities they're in power at schools even but they're certainly in power in uh, you know governmental organizations and uh, if you're an MP you know that that's that's you know the air that you breathe you don't want to upset a new class journalist uh, you don't want to upset you know, you're surrounded by nuclear civil servants who are, um, you know, framing problems in a particular way and so forth. And it just seems that we can't vote them out of power. Mm. So no matter who you vote for, you're going to get the same thing. You are going to get a huge state. You're going to get massive borrowing. You're going to get money printing. Um, you know, you, and, and it seems there is nothing that you can do through the democratic process at the moment to change that. So you think we're finished as a country? Well, I think that it, it almost feels that there needs to be a monumental... Purge. Yeah. <laughs> terrible crash, purge, disaster mm. for there to be something rebuilt. I mean, what to do with the Tories? You know, I mean, they, they are... I mean, for small status like you and me, I mean, you've got Steve Baker and a few Thatcherites sort of tucked away in the corner there. 
But, you know, are, are, they, are they about to take over and do anything radical? And otherwise, who do you vote for? So it's really, it's, it's bleak. Yep, I think we're doomed. <laughs> I've been mean, saying this for a while. Not everyone agrees with me at the IEA. I mean, the point of the IEA, I suppose, is we, we're supposed to say, look, this is what we need to do. We can save the job. And maybe there is a case for that. You know, maybe I'm being too gloomy. You know, in the 70s, Arthur Selden and Ralph Harris and the Adam Smith Institute, they kind of took this on. And everyone thought the country was finished in the 70s, yeah. right? I mean, more so. I mean, you, you, in, in, the, in Margaret Death of the Revolutionary, you, yeah. you, you talk about the state of the 70s, which, of course, a lot of people won't remember what have been alive and, and so that kind of folk memory of how bad the 70s was has kind of faded hasn't it over time yeah but it is it is worth i mean you're right wanting to now sort of turn slightly more optimistically i mean what they thought of the that seemed impossible mm. what they did and they were talking about you know the art of the possible and in a sense if you say right what what needs to be done is so extraordinarily radical over here um, and then go for it you know you never know i mean maybe there's a maybe there's a way but the the obstacle Big obstacle is the Tory party. We know that the Labour Party is not going to do that. But, you know, the hope, sort of residual hope, is in some way the Tories are meant to be the party of laissez-faire. They're meant to be the party of free markets. Mm. But, you know, I mean, I've just read Tory MPs defending the fact that the state owns Channel 4. Right. <laughs> That's a bit of a weird... Do you not think it's a bit of a weird kind of fight for the government to have? Why do you think they're doing this because it's, they're going to raise very little money take on channel 4 take on channel 4 yeah i mean as opposed to taking on the license fee which actually people do kind of care about yeah well i think that i mean if they uh, 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 maybe there's a sort of twin strategy that I'm, I'm i'm not aware of they really need to hit both the bbc and channel 4 um, and i think you know fair dues on 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 both fronts you know whatever they can do decriminalizing the license fee mm. uh, just you know uh, ha however which way they cut it you know there's there's really has it's shocking that you know the bbc i think by uh, an insider of the bbc uh, head of news and current affairs previous said that the bbc controlled 75 percent of um news output on british tv and radio i mean state broadcaster controlling 75 percent mm. of news i mean that's absolutely <laughs> disgraceful and by state broadcaster i mean that it doesn't necessarily re reflect the views of the government in power, but it does reflect the status views of the people who work in that organisation. Mm. Um, and that is, um, you know, utterly, you know, disgraceful. And why is Channel 4 still in public ownership, you know, naked, naked attraction, you know, showing men's bodies, you know. <laughs> you know. Um, but they used to show your documentaries, didn't they? They did, Which was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they showed the global warming one, they showed the Margaret Thatcher one, they showed the trillion pound horror story. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, they, once before then as well. Yeah, Rise and Fall of GM, the environmental Nature, stuff. things yeah. like that. Um, what was the last one they put out of yours, Thatcher one? Um, uh, I think it was, I did a, a, a film about Nigel Farage. I oh, yes, yeah, I remember one. that. Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but you're right, there was, there was a sense in which Channel 4, certainly in the past, um, still kind of remembered that remit that Margaret Thatcher had given it, that they've got to be counterintuitive and mm. so counter, you know, countercultural. And they honestly assessed uh, mainstream culture as being left wing and um, uh, woke and, you know, the, the stuff that it is, um, and felt obliged to put out stuff that was contrary to that. Not much. Yeah. I think I was about the only about, one yeah. who sort of snuck in, but nevertheless, some stuff. So they were putting your stuff out and hating every minute of it, presumably? Well, not necessarily. In, they had re some really good individual commissioning editors back in the day. They had uh, Hamish Makura and Sarah Ramsden and uh, our, our, our folk like that who were prepared to um, you know, go out on a limb and actually relished going out on a limb, you know, mm. no, no, no matter what their right. politics were. Well, I mean, Hamish was a, 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 you know, a, a PhD geologist, so that's why he wanted to do the uh, climate change one, because uh. geologists are, tend to be skeptics by and large, because they right? see the kind of big picture. But, um, but yeah, there, 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 was, there was a little moment in history where there were some, there, there were some cracks, but it hasn't been for a long time. Um, I, I'll try, every, I sort of get disheartened and stop trying, and then every so often I'll try again. I'm going to try with your excellent um, vaping smoking idea mm. to get one we'll past them. We'll so I'll throw down the later. gauntlet. Channel 4, do you dare to have a film presented by uh, Comrade Snowden 
on. No, I didn't um, say I'd present it. I think Andre. you should definitely present it. You'd be fantastic. You present, right? all, present all these. Handsome ones. fella. <laughs> uh, was it the Farage one that, that was at the straw that broke the camel's back? Or, or, or did he just kind of stop picking up the phone? Or I think there was a slight sort of change of personnel in Channel 4 and they just tend to become more left-leaning. And also, I think culturally there's been, you know, there's, there's, it's just become increasingly closed. I mean, you imagine with the advent of um, social media that things maybe are going to open up a bit. And, but, but, but no, I think there's been an in, you know, a kind of entrenchment. Yeah. And I mean, even with kind of global warming, I think the, 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 the scope for scepticism now is, yeah, it's uh, is far less. Yeah. It's just you can't, you can't get in there. Yeah, it's beyond the pale now. Yeah, I mean, we, th we imagine, ordinary people, I'm sure, imagine that we live in an open society. I think that, you know, in really, in, in dangerous, subtle ways, we don't. But speaking of things that are beyond the pale, your last two films, which I, which I also love, have been about race in America and guns. Yeah. Quite controversial topics. What were the, just remind me what the titles were of these. There was a great American race game. Yeah. And the, um, the, the guns film has just been uh, renamed, going to, to be launched in the US, and it's, um, I'm trying to remember what it's called. <laughs> Guns, liberty is it? It's not. It's not guns and freedom. It's gun power, uh, firepower to the people. Firepower to the people. Firepower to right. the people is what it's called. Could you give us a brief synopsis of both of the films for those who haven't seen it? Yeah. Well, the race one was uh, there was something about the whole racism thing which I thought wasn't at all right because mm. the um, everyone was you know the, it's it's obviously so huge now the battle against racism but it it, it, it struck me that this was riddled with hypocrisy and uh, lies and double meanings and all that kind of thing. So I wanted to look at race politics in America to see what was going on. Yeah, there's a lot of history um, in it, isn't there? A lot of history in the, uh, in the film to try and explain why... I mean, the central argument is that a lot of people who are making the biggest noise about race at the moment, BLM and others, are not really fighting racism. They're mm. not interested in combating racism. They're not interested in going beyond racism. They're using racism for cynical political purposes. Um, and so we kind of unpack that and try and work out why, if that's true, and if so, why? And the guns one essentially says we should legalise guns. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's where, I, that's where I beg to differ, I think. I don't think we should let everybody go around with guns. Yeah, no, I, I, can, I can sort of see not letting everyone <laughs> go around uh, uh, with guns, but I think that um, the, the, I think a, a level of gun ownership kind of envisaged in the Second Amendment, I would uh, argue strongly for. Um, again, that, I, I started making the film because I was in um, slightly two minds about it. Because on the one hand, intuitively, I thought, you know, being a diehard libertarian these days, that that seemed like a good idea. But of course, you mentioned guns, especially in Europe. Yeah. And they pff, waggle their eyebrows and they say, oh, my God, no, look at America and gun ownership and so mm. on. So I just wanted to look at it sort of more closely and see what, you know, what, what, what the arguments were. Um, and actually, statistically, it's, it's a really interesting argument because you have you know, no correlation either within the US or historically with um, gun, the prevalence of gun ownership and murder. Yeah, so and murder believe, rate. Yeah. That's really interesting. So you have, for example, Switzerland that has one of the highest mm -hmm. rates of gun ownership in the world and it has a murder rate which is one of the lowest. Mm -hmm. I mean, half that of the UK. Finland and Israel as well, I think. Also yeah, you've got a lot of the, the, the Scandi countries and things. Canada, you have really high rates of gun ownership. Within the US, where you have states with huge amounts of gun ownership, they're very often the states with the lowest murder rates. And l by lowest murder rates, I mean um, lower than the UK and France and but Would they, they be mainly rural like states where people are usually got like they hunting tend, guns, rifles? They tend to be states that don't have big urban areas. Yeah. The place in America where, and it's not, I'm not saying they have a low murder rate because they've got lots of guns, but it just happens that they've got lots of guns and mm. they have very low murder rates. The, 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 the places where you have the, the, the disproportionate huge murder rates in the US are in the, the ghettos, urban yeah. ghettos, and um, they're through the roof there. Um, and so we look at why that is, and it, you, essentially the gun murder problem in, in America is tied up with the welfare problem uh, uh, in America, how big welfareism really you know, corrupted and poisoned a lot of these poor areas in America and led to you know, a degree of family breakdown which right. is staggering and violent. And you use exactly the same argument in the race documentary as well. About yeah, the they're state. both kind of films about the welfare state in a way. Yeah, right. 
Um, but uh, we look at that, and then we look at the history of uh, the, you know, the Second Amendment and the long history of popular ownership of arms and democracy, right back to the ancient Greeks. And so you have, um, you know, the uh, Greek democracy emerged after the so-called hoplite revolution, where ordinary Greek farmers managed to get hold of arms. And Aristotle and Plato and others all observed that in Greek cities where uh, uh, the people carried arms, there was democracy. And wherever the oligarchy was able to disarm the, the people, there was oligarchy. But they would be too. like swords and bows and arrows, wouldn't they? Yeah. They As were, opposed they, to they assault were, rifles. They, they were. There were spears and swords. But, you know, they used them pretty, <laughs> pretty effectively back <laughs> in the ancient days. And likewise with the, the ancient Romans. The early Romans, the, the legions, were legions of armed um, citizen militias. There was no direct taxation in Rome to pay for a professional army. These were, because they were sort of essentially, you know, an extension of ancient Greek cities, the, you know, early Rome. Um, they were armed militias of citizens. And, and it's when the decline of the Republic begins when, uh, you know, they end up being very successful, these militias of citizens. They're terribly good fighting forces, generally. Um, and they, you know, win an empire, and that's where the corruption is. And you can't get a citizen farmer, armed citizen farmer, and send him off to Asia Minor for... Uh, uh, three years to, to man a garrison, so you get a, a, the, the start of a professional army in Rome and the disarming of the general population in Italy. Um, and sure enough, you get the collapse of the Republic. And we go on to the Middle Ages, and you have throughout medieval Europe, you know, laws um, preventing ordinary people, preventing serfs from having arms. Um, and uh, you know, the peasant revolts always end in tears and bloodshed mm. because the serfs go and, you know, they're yeah. up against proper armed forces. And the, the change comes. I mean, it's no accident that you, it, 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 it's in, in England that they don't manage to create a standing army and where they have to rely on armed militias of yeomen. yeomen. And sure enough, that's where you see democracy. Likewise, in the Netherlands, you have militias of citizens rather than a standing army in the, um, you know, under the king and the nobles you get a republic. Switzerland, the same. You get militias. Wherever you find, and they knew this, the founders of the American, uh, you know, the, the, the American Constitution, wherever you had countries where there was an absolutist regime with a standing army, then there was not democracy, there was not freedom. Wherever you had citizen militias, there was freedom, going right the way back history. And that's why they were absolutely de determined to make that the model for um, America. Right. And moving forward, we look at you know, the, um, uh, the, 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 the 20th century, and com communist regimes are absolutely, have been always absolutely determined to dis disarm the population, um, which is why they can kill millions of them. You know, if everyone had guns, there's, there's just no way in the world they could get away with what has happened mm -hmm. in communist regimes. Likewise, the Nazis tried to disarm, obviously, other people they invaded. They wouldn't go into Switzerland because everyone in Switzerland had a fucking gun. You know, yeah. literally every family in Switzerland had a great big bloody machine gun and they, and they weren't going to take that. I mean, the hills didn't help either, but nevertheless, that's what put them off doing that. And wherever they had populations where they weren't able to disarm them, in France, they suddenly had a resistance because lots of people had guns in France. In Italy, you had the partisans because ordinary people had guns. Um, and I've said with Ukraine, you know, if it's tricky joining NATO, don't join NATO. Just, you know, when, when this war is done, every country beside Russia should have the equivalent of a Second Amendment and, like Switzerland, give every family, every household, a big bloody, you know, um, a proper machine gun mm -hmm. with ammo um, and, uh, and then, you know, Russia ain't going to invade. You make a good case, but still I just think somehow it's not going to work having people in this country with guns. I like guns as well. You know, I grew up with guns. I like shooting guns, uh, but, and I would like to go around with a gun, you know, I quite like the idea of being armed, it's just that well, the risks of everybody else being let's armed. Let's link it up with the size of the national debt. I want to, you know, maybe that's the solution if we can't do it by democratic means. <laughs> How do you mean? <laughs> well, I'm just getting a bit radical here. Link, uh, armed is? uprising. Oh, you think we'd... You think, so you genuinely think we'd be a freer country if we were all armed, or lots of people were armed? I think that I think our freedom, would, our freedom would be more secure if there was a common ownership of guns. Mm. Tell me about your Trotsky-esque past. Oh. I've heard a bit about it in the, in the, uh, in, in the past, but give us, give us a story. Oh, well. how, how, how left-wing were you? Oh, well, very, I was, very left wing. I was, I was, I was very left wing. It sort of started when I was um, uh, 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 up north, and I mean, at the age of 
14, 15, I remember joining the Labour Party Young Socialists in South Shields and becoming Secretary of the Labour Party so Young Socialists. Yeah, yeah. 15, I don't think you were allowed to join until 16, <laughs> but nevertheless, I joined early and then got involved in the militant tendency and various other sort of... Where did this groups. come from then? Do you know, I think, looking back, it was kind of, a, you know, effete romanticism. You know, you th Marxism had this kind of... Glorious, you were reading sort of a bit of Marx at the age of 15. Yeah, no, I started, I remember first getting Isaiah Berlin's book on Karl Marx off the shelf and then thinking this is, you know, really sexy. And my family was vaguely uh, uh, left-wing and... Um, was Berlin pro-Marx? Huh? Was it no, no, but he's anti Marx. Oh, but, yeah, but, but that, that was that got you. I read it, right. and I thought, whatever he was, I think Marx, Marx was sexy, you know. If you're and if you and, I, and I'm, you know, at the age of fifteen, thinking, you know, I'd really like to go to university in the south, and I'd really like to. And there was a romance, and you know, if you if you're and a kind of, you know, a, a kind of social aspiration about it, you know, did I want to, you know, go into the rope factory that my dad worked in, mm -hmm. or did I want to go and, you know, be a poet or a writer or a right. something like that? So there was a kind of intellectual appeal. Um, and um, and kind of, uh, and looking back, I, I can see a kind of real intellectual snobbery about people who kind of indulge in that sort of nonsense. Um, um, snobbery in what way? Well, you, you kind of, it's all a bit superior and you, you, you're, you're, you're thinking on a higher plane. Right, yeah. yeah and you're yeah. morally superior and you're, and you're mixing with, you know, sort of, uh, you know, romantic leftists through history. And it's, you know, you're with Trotsky in Mexico and you're m m mixing with Frida Kahlo. You know, it's all kind of, it's all that. It is quite pretentious, um, Marxism in general. And particularly post-Marx. I mean, Marx you can more or less read and it's not too bad, but the post-Marxists are deliberately And I had a cash with world. the teachers at school, you know, because I was, I was, you know, the sixth former who was a Marxist and you go to university and you can get the girls. You mm. can't get the girls if you're going to be a young Tory, obviously. <laughs> they, won't a, they won't get anywhere near you. But if you're a commie, there's a kind of, you know, in those circles, and that if you're in, uh, you know, in the intellectual middle class, you want to be a leftist. Yeah. You, know, you, want to, you want to do that. And, I mean, looking back, I mean, you know, obviously you say it's for the workers, but actually it's just, you know, romantic, Status. romantic intelligentsia wank, uh, you know. And how deep did you get into this? You, oh, I mean, I, I'm very deep. I've got, I've got you know... Bookshelves are worth of ridiculous books that I've spent far too long reading on, you know, I don't know, Karl Korsch and Althusser and Lukács, everything he wrote, and, you know, um, uh, uh, on Marxist economics and philosophy and politics. I mean, really, I mean, I wasted so much time. <laughs> I mean, Hegel, the lot. I mean, I've just... It was, but in a sense, it made the switch when I finally realised, you know, this is all bollocks. Um, <laughs> The, the, the transition was all the more radical. Yeah. I think I'm all the more now intolerant of uh, the left and, uh, uh, than, than, than I might have been had I not gone through that. Is there nothing you take out of that literature which you think, OK, that was a good point? Do you think it's all rubbish? I think uh, class analysis is useful. Yeah. Um, and I think that... But every, every th the Marxist use of it was all wrong. So, you know, they, they think that working class are anti-capitalist. No, they're not. Absolutely not. They've mm. benefited enormously from industrial capitalism. They've benefited enormously from mass production. They've benefited from it. And, you know, they think that the, boor, uh, you know, Marx thinks that, you know, the, the petty bourgeoisie and all the rest of it are pro-capitalist. Nonsense. There's a big section of the petty bourgeoisie who are incredible, who are the anti-capitalists, of which the Marxists all, you know, belong to that class, the, you know, the new class. The commercial middle class, the commercial petty bourgeois, they're pro-capitalist, they're the... Uh, Jeremy Clarkson loving, yeah. you know, estate agents and car dealers and all that sort of thing. And you have the upper classes who historically have been very anti-capitalist. Um, so yeah. the, uh, the use of classes really is, is, is it, M Marxist didn't invent it, but nevertheless that thinking of things in terms of groups and their, you know, collective interests and ideas, I think is really useful. But the Marxist use of it is absolute codswell. You know, they, they tell lies with it. Yeah. Uh, every now and again I pick up Capital to try and read another 50 pages or so, you know, before I die. And I just find it impossible because it, the, uh, it's not unreadable for that period of time. It's okay. You can kind of concentrate and get, and get on with it. It's just from the very start based on a false premise and then he puts another false premise on oh, the whole the labor all, theory of uh, value and so it's on. all rubbish. it doesn't make any sense it's all rubbish i mean you know there's you know great important passages where you say that, you know capitalism will lead to the immiseration of the workers you yeah know, because um you had to be skilled before the machines are going to take away the skills you pay more for skills therefore they're going to be poorer 
that, that's the level of the analysis. Mm. Um, and the division of labor, you know, the, 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 these things are going to, uh, because of the division, of, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, it did, we're not poorer. Ordinary people are not poorer. And they say there's going to be this, uh, you know, the, the machines are going to you know, create masses of goods. Who's going to buy these goods? <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> no, masses of goods are not going to be produced if no one's buying them, or not for very long, two weeks. <laughs> and that's it. Um, it's all nonsense. I mean, it's, it's absolutely all nonsense. But you have, and still have, in British universities and Western universities, piles of people who buy into this. Mm -hmm. You know, it is, it is, the weird thing is, and that's where I think the class analysis comes in, because if you've got a, a class who's, you know, have a particular worldview, you can argue with them to the council come home, they're going to cling on to it mm. for dear life. And if their worldview is, we want higher taxes, more regulation, bigger state, more powerful state, capitalism is evil, you can throw anything you like at them. You will not change their mind. You will not change their mind. If there's a Marxist sort of sitting here, you know, we can, it, would you forget it. The, he, we can say to them, look, Marx said it was scientific socialism that workers would be poorer. He wrote that in the middle of the 19th century. Are workers poorer? I mean, you know. But most of these people haven't read Marx, I would assume. I mean, we, we tend to use the word Marxist a bit by various people, but I don't think many of them have, have read the stuff. I think they just fall into the same, what is probably quite an eternal trap of just thinking that life is somehow unfair and if we changed it in certain ways then it would it, it would be fair because there's exp exploitation going on you know i think hayek explained this quite well saying that you know we're really just born to be in sort of small tribes where we share things and that feels right and normal to us and so when you when we get into large urban you know large, large cities or whole countries we still kind of we're still reaching for that. We still think that's somehow the right way to do it. And anybody who makes a profit is ex ex exploited. I think that's an they've inherent sort of, feeling. They've sort of given up on an unfair. I mean, now they've stopped campaigning for the working class, I think, effectively. They, they now they do earth. So right. they don't say, if you read Piketty, he doesn't say it's unfair that all these people in the developing world have got salaries much lower than mine. I think my salary should be <laughs> distributed there. He doesn't say that. He says it's unfair that people who work in academe, like himself, yeah. and the public sector, France, are paid yeah. less than very highly paid people in the commercial sector. Mm -hmm. Those people ought to have their money taken away, and the public sector should be paid more. It's unrealistic, he says, to redistribute from people in the public sector, like himself, to much poorer people in the third world. Oh, that is not right. what they mean by that. And in fact, if you look, I at thought it was the global wealth tax. Um, uh, not to, uh, yeah, to pay people like Piketty. Right. <laughs> if, you, if you look at what these people write about the developing country, you say that they, it, it's terrible that the, you know, the developing world shouldn't make the same mistakes as the Western world. They shouldn't industrialise like the Western world. Mm. You, know, you read Al Gore and he says, you know, it's, you know, the lovely thing about living in one of these poor countries is, is much lower sodium in the, in the diet, much less stress. <laughs> yeah, right. So you know, we're suffering from all this less health obesity. and stress. Mm. Lucky them you know, have got a much more authentic, rounded, whole world because they haven't succumbed to the disgusting consumer society that we... In other words, they're arguing they should stay poor. Mm. And they... And this is... But that's a sort of Marxist idea as well. He kind of romanticised the pre-industrial society and Rousseau as well. Yeah, no, Engels in the, uh, in the condition of the English working class laments that, you know, they're all in Manchester and, you know, having a rare old time in the bars and gambling and just sort of <laughs> shagging each other. And really, you know, there were not very long ago in lovely rural areas. Mm. And if they were out of hand, the local squire who also ran the, the inn would sort of reprimand them and tell them, oh, this was the ideal for Engels. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, it, it is, it's shocking what bollocks the, 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 the left spoke before but now in fact they've even given up on you know it, it before the, the the reds would say we're going to build a social society that will outproduce capitalism yeah but now the kind of green anti-capitalism says we're producing too much yeah we must produce less you know we're all consuming and that too much. i think is a direct result of communism and socialism failing it's like okay we we lost that game so we'll try and turn that defeat into a sort of victory it's like, there, you know, there, actually there, consumption is a bad thing and production is a bad thing there is certainly that although i think if you go back in time that actually the, the game was never really uh, you know progress for ordinary working class people it was really building a big state do you think so you think it's always been totally self-serving yeah the um, the you know it was uh, it was obvious very early on that Socialism wasn't going to deliver riches, but um, that was not the game. 
it was to deliver a really you know, super strong state. Martin, I think our 30 minutes are up. <gasps> I haven't been looking at my, my watch, but I suspect it's uh, in that neck of the woods. Very interesting talking to you, as always. Thank you very much for coming on the show. I'm just going to do my piece to camera to finish now. Thank you very much for watching at home. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. Thank you especially to those of you who are good enough to donate to the IEA. If you'd like to join their number, then um, you can donate at iea.org.uk slash donate or patreon.com slash IEA London. And you have a cast iron guarantee that we will not dox you. We will not tell people your names and addresses. No matter how much people ask who funds us, we will never reveal. Unless, of course, you want to shout about it yourselves, which you may well want to because you'd be doing a wonderful thing. I've been Chris Snowden. This is Martin Durkin. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next time on Swift Half with Snowden. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.